All right, so uh, we're going to talk about organ support. We're really going to talk about two things. We're not going to talk about ECMO, which is one of the organ support technologies, but we're going to talk about CRRT and about something called MARS. Um, the MARS topic, you guys have all seen CRRT, you've all heard about CRRT, so CRRT will move through a little bit faster. MARS, I think, is a sort of emerging technology and something that's more going to become more relevant in the future in both critical care as well as in surgical critical care specifically. Um, so let's get through this. And that's not how you click forward. Just hit the trackpad thing. Uh, yeah, or the arrow keys. Okay. Uh, okay, they're working. So we're going to look at organ support. Uh, we're going to talk about it a little bit. We're going to talk about uh, renal replacement therapy, and then we'll talk about uh, extracorporeal albumin dialysis, or specifically MARS, which is a part of uh, part of that. So what is organ support? It's the exogenous replacement of a particular organ function in uh, a patient. It's either through pharmacologic or synthetic means. So you can do organ support with medications. So every time you give Lasix, that's actually organ support one way or another, right? Like you're trying to diurese a patient uh, or it can be through synthetic means. So putting patient on CRRT, for example. Uh, there are several different organ systems that are amenable to organ support. So the pulmonary system, obviously ventilators and ECMO, cardiac system, uh, intraortic balloon pump, impella, ECMO. I'm sure that Dr. Nissen could wax poetic about that particular category, um, but we'll skip it. So GI, uh, TPN, and then renal dialysis transplant, in our case, CRRT, liver, albumin dialysis, maybe bioreactors. It's another technology that's uh, being developed right now. And then blood, and this is something that most people don't think about is the blood as an organ system. Uh, it's helpful in trauma. It's helpful in resuscitation to think of blood as an organ system because uh, it it's a, has an important role in damage control um, resuscitation. But plasma filtration, plasma exchange, and transfusion would be organ support technologies for um, organ support technologies for blood. We're going to focus on renal and liver today. So. It's important to think about organ support technologies as a bridge. All right. So you have to have somewhere you're starting, which is organ failure in this case. You have to have somewhere you're going, which is a destination. And anything in between is likely death for most of these patients. So these are our technologies of sort of last resort for supporting that, that organ. Uh, you can't, without dialysis, without organ support, you cannot live without kidneys. Um, if without liver support or liver transplant, you can't live without a liver. You can't live without a heart. So there's really not any other option. And this begets the point that you need to think about where that patient's going. So is this, are you giving uh, the patient organ support because it's a bridge to recovery? You think their kidneys are gonna get better. You think their liver is gonna improve. You think their lungs are gonna improve. They developed ARDS from COVID pneumonia. You put them on ECMO. You're waiting for the lungs to get better. Or is this gonna be a bridge to transplant? Is the organ shot and all you're doing is buying time until the patient is a candidate for transplant or an organ becomes available? Or is this destination therapy? Is this therapy provided until the patient expires? Meaning they don't have, either they have other medical comorbidities or they have other things that might prevent them from surviving independent of the organ failure you're trying to support. What you never wanna do is put someone on an organ support technology if really what you have is a bridge to nowhere. You're going from somewhere that's non-functional and you're ending somewhere that's non-functional. In that case, all you're doing is prolonging, prolonging that problem. Uh, and this is one of the most challenging things I think in critical care is determining candidacy for some of the more advanced critical care technologies that we have. It's not uncommon to have a conversation about putting someone on ECMO or having a conversation to put someone on CRRT or, or Mars or whatever. And then uh, a few days later, have the conversation with the family that, you know, hey, sorry, this isn't going to work. And those conversations can be awkward because people are seeing it not as a bridge to transplant or a bridge to recovery. They just see this as like another thing keeping their loved one alive. So renal replacement therapy. You can't talk about renal replacement therapy without putting up an awkward slide about acute kidney injury. So there's three primary grading systems we use for kidney injury. This is important because it has to do with largely research. The important things from a surgeon's perspective and from the surgical critical care perspective is, are they making urine? Are they clearing solvent or solute? So those are the two things that are really important from us, from our perspective. Can they manage their volume? And 
uh, are they clearing solute? But from a research perspective, people need to codify it. We need to understand where you are in this sort of stratification. And when the original research was being done, largely we were using the rifle classification, risk, injury, loss, failure, or failure, loss, uh, and an end stage. Now, uh, more commonly, the consensus criteria being used, certainly by the medicine doctors, is Cadigo. If you spend much time in the burn center, people use Aiken uh, often and tend to be more frequently. But what's in, or more frequently, what's important to realize is that rifle has a two categories of loss and end stage, which really, when you think about it, becomes chronic kidney disease. So they're more or less the same. The only difference is highlighted with a convenient little red circle, like a radiologist looked at it. Um, and it's that the difference is 0.3 versus 0.5 increase in serum creatinine, uh, that's the only difference between the, the, the major categorization system. So Aiken 1, 2, 3 is essentially the same as Cadigo 1, 2, 3. That's sort of what's important to remember. The consequences of acute kidney injury are also important, and they're not independent of the kidney injury itself. So most of the time, I'll be honest, when I thought of kidney injury, I thought of kidney injury as this is the body telling me I screwed up when I was managing the patient and I didn't give them enough fluid. I gave them too much fluid. I gave too much solvent or solute. Um, that is not entirely accurate. Independent of the cause of acute kidney injury, acute kidney injury accounts for about a 41% mortality in ICU players, all comers. And that's in uh, acute kidney injury grade immaterial, meaning AKI stage one, two, three, or Aiken one, two, three, or Cadigo one, two, three, you pick. Um, and in COVID, interestingly, it's even higher. Some studies have looked at as high as 70% um, or close to 70%. Postoperatively, I think this is important. Oh, this is really cut off. Uh, sorry. So postoperatively, this is something that I found a little bit surprising. But there's an increased risk of death in the first post-operative year. The hazard ratio is 2.96 and has a significant confidence interval. Um, there's an increased risk of death in the first post-operative year for all patients who have an AK, a perioperative AKI. That, that's actually kind of sobering, but I think what it demonstrates is that the kidney uh, is a very sensitive organ. And if you cause derangements, it's a, a sign of underlying uh, illness that pre-existed whatever insult was there, um, and that it can function as a harbinger of sort of things to come. So if, if patients get acute kidney injuries, it doesn't just mean, uh, it doesn't just mean you give them not enough fluid. That may be a patient who you didn't give them enough fluid, but the reason that's the problem is that underlying they have a lot of, of biochemical uh, disturbance. So assuming a patient's an acute kidney injury, what are the indications for uh, renal replacement therapy or for CRRT or uh, IHD? Generally accepted criteria are volume overload, acid, or refractory acidosis. So this is important. You can't just say someone has an acidosis and, oh, they need to go on CRRT or I'm going to fix their acidosis with CRRT because really often that just masks the underlying problem that's causing the acidosis. So a refractory acidosis, uh, a patient whose acidosis is impeding their pressor support, a patient whose acidosis is impeding, uh, impeding their ability, uh, their metabolic, or, or worsening their metabolic demand. So generally speaking, we say a pH of less than 7.1 after attempts at correction. So that includes bicarb and other things. Because when you think about it, we can get into this a little bit later, really the mechanism that CRRT corrects acidosis is that the replacement fluid that you use has a ton of bicarb in it. Uh, and so it's really just giving the patient bicarb. It doesn't actually, the filter doesn't really clear the lactate. That's how it's always described, but that's not how it works. Uh, hyperkalemia is probably the most common indication in the medicine ICU. In the surgical ICU, volume overload oftentimes is, is a, the more common reason. A uremia, so a symptomatic uremia, some studies have used a cutoff of about 112 for a BUN, but generally speaking, you don't need to dialyze someone if their BUN is 100. There are rare circumstances where that's the case, but a symptomatic 
uh, uremia. So that's going to be a uremic encephalopathy, or patients with documented platelet dysfunction, or high bleeding risk, and you're concerned that that platelet dysfunction from uremia, uremia could cause bleeding. And then toxic exposure or ingestion. And this goes to the specific dialyzable toxins, um, phenobarbital, methanol, uh, again, mostly medicine, ICU, and emergency medicine folks. So how does CRRT work? I see there's some people who are probably not as old as I am in the back, except for maybe Trappy or Dr. Trappe. No, you're not as old as I am. No, I'm not. Um, do, does, <laughs> does anybody... Does anybody in the room who's not sitting at the back table know what this picture is from? It's from a classic film from the early 1990s, Blood In, Blood Out, about gang wars in Los Angeles. But that blood in, blood out is how CRRT works. So we're gonna extracorporealize blood. We're gonna run it through a filter. And what is hard to appreciate when you look at the CRRT filters, they're shaped, uh, they're shaped like as a cylinder. There's four ports on them. There's a dialysate in and out port, and there's a blood in and out port. This filter is what does the work for, uh, for dialysis. That's true for intermittent hemodialysis. It's true for CRRT, and it doesn't matter what mode of CRRT and the filter is doing, doing, uh, doing the work. The filters function based on four principles. So diffusion, convection, ultrafiltration, and absorption. And what's important to know is that these little capillary hollow fibers connect the blood end. I guess I can point with this. No, oh, maybe not. Uh, they connect the blood in to the blood out. So the blue top, the red top to the blue bottom. So the blood flows in, the blood flows through the capillary tubes, it doesn't actually contact the space between those capillary tubes. Dialysate flows in in a countercurrent, flows in the opposite direction of the blood, so from the bottom to the top, and that dialysate bathes those capillary tubes, and those capillary tubes are actually the filter. The reason it's designed like this is to increase the surface area, right, of the membrane, so that there's a larger surface area in contact between the blood or the, the membrane between the blood and the dialysate, uh, that surface area is large. That increase, increases the efficiency. So diffusion. Um, diffusion is the method that uh, most, most of the time medicine doctors are using. This is the largest contributor in dialysis is diffusion. So solutes, just like you remember from middle school chemistry class, solutes follow a concentration gradient from high to low. So if you flow blood in one direction across a membrane and you flow a dialysate in the opposite direction against the membrane, the solute concentration is trying to reach equipoise between those two fluid currents. And so solute moves from high concentration to low concentration. The countercurrent flow is important. If you hook dialysis up in the same direction or you flow it in the same direction, it's not nearly as efficient. And you can think of that as the blood coming in at a high concentration is exposed to fluid, the solute crosses and they travel together as they move out of the filter instead of in countercurrent where there's the, the gradient remains more constant across. Does that make sense? Um, there's no mixing of dialysate and there's no mixing uh, with blood. Uh, it's very efficient for small molecules and it's inefficient for large molecules. And this is the predominant contributor in CVV, continuous veno venous hemofiltration, or hemodialysis, rather, excuse me, CVVHD. So you see HD, hemodialysis, think dialysate solution, think countercurrent flow. The next, uh, the next mechanism that CRT works on is convection. This uses solvent drag, or the idea that the movement of a volume of fluid across a membrane will pull with it solvent or solute within that solvent that's moving across the membrane. There is no dialysate in convection. Uh, and no, oh, whoop, that should say substitution or replacement fluid is mixed with the blood. So I don't know how to edit that, but that's incorrect. So the substitution fluid or the replacement fluid is mixed with the blood. And so this is those, you see those giant bags, and this is the predominant system that we use in surgical critical care. Um, 
because you replace the volume of fluid that's coming out as the ultra filtrate or the sort of urine, you can think of it. We can replace that one-to-one -one and so that we can run the dialysis even. So we can get a solvent drag. We can pull solute out of the blood and replace the volume of fluid that comes out with a different fluid so that the overall fluid balance within the patient remains the same. Does that, does that make sense? Um, it is effective for larger molecules. It's somewhat less efficient for smaller molecules. And this hemofiltration is the predominant method in CVVH, which is what most commonly you'll see in our ICUs. So again, the replacement fluid is mixed with the blood in this case, and there is no dialysate running countercurrent. So everything that crosses the membrane is ultrafiltrate. Does that make sense? So in that canister, in this canister, the dialysate out is actually like urine out. And there's blood and solvent, or blood and replacement fluid rather, going in the blood in and coming out the blood out. Does that make sense? How you put the fluid in and where you put the replacement. So if you've been in the burn center, you've heard people talk about, well, are we going to do pre-filter replacement or post-filter replacement, all of that? Those are, in a general sense, semantic arguments. Um, but they do affect the function of the CRRT, but it's a little sort of nitty gritty to get into that. But just know that if you're CVVH, if you're doing hemofiltration, replacement fluid is mixing with the blood. Uh, the next is ultrafiltration, and this is uh, this is a cappuccino maker. So this is pressure applied on one side across a filter. So it's the hydrostatic pressure of the pump that's generating pressure into the filter that's causing movement across the membrane. This is fluid only. So you can see, I mean, you know there's a pump on CVVH, right? Uh, you know there's a pump. So the pump pressure creates a hydrostatic pressure across the, uh, across the membrane. Whether it's dialysis, whether it's hemofiltration, ultrafiltration exists. This happens in every, every part of uh, dialysis. This is a necessary portion. But this is not responsible for providing any solute clearance. So this ultrafiltration doesn't lower your K. It doesn't lower your BUN. It doesn't improve uh, your, you know, your platelet function by removing BUN. It doesn't clear phenobarbital. It doesn't do any of those things. All it does is move fluid across. There is one mode of CRRT that we really don't use in this hospital, but uh, that only uses ultrafiltration. There's no replacement fluid or anything. You just force the blood across the filter and pull fluid off. It's called scuff. Um, but that mode is, is not used very frequently because it has a higher risk of clotting the filter, et cetera. So, but it is a technology that's available. Adsorption uh, is another method of clearance. It's, we say method of clearance, but really uh, it's generally speaking a problem. Um, and you can think of this as the filter getting gummed up. So this is stuff sticking to the filter, either um, based on the charge of the particle, the size of the particle, the pore size of the filter, whatever reason it is, it's the physical adherence of solutes and biomass to the membrane. This actually is advantageous in that it can clear large molecules. And so there are filters designed to function based on adsorption. Uh, and most of these are like charcoal filters. So for uh, the clearance of like protein bound or large molecule toxins, uh, people will use adsorption, special filters um, called like for chemo purification. Um, and those are cut into that circuit. So, but from a perspective in the surgical ICU, generally speaking, it's a problem. And this is why filter life is short, right? Relatively. So you put a filter on and the nurse comes to you and says, hey, the filter clotted and you take the filter out and you replace the filter, probably the reason that happened is a combination of blood clotting and absorption. So modes of CRRT, there's sort of four predominant modes. Um, scuff, we already sort of talked about, it's slow continuous ultrafiltration. So its only purpose is to remove fluid. It's used almost exclusively in heart failure. Um, patients who have kidneys that are still functioning. So 
the patient can clear their potassium, they can do all their, their normal human kidney things, but they aren't able to clear the volume of fluid needed to offload the heart or to offload the lungs. So scuff is used in that case rarely. CV, most of the time, right, if you have a volume overload problem, you're also going to have a solute clearance problem because the kidney does both of those jobs. And so if one fails, the other generally follows. Um, in rare circumstances, that's not the case. CVVH, most commonly what we use in the surgical ICU, uh, it's continuous venovenous hemofiltration. The advantage here, well, we'll talk about the advantage in a second. Um, CVVHD is continuous venovenous hemodialysis. We touched on that before. And then CVVHDF is a combination of both CVVH and CVVHD. So you have both a replacement fluid and a countercurrent dialysis fluid current. So you're able to sort of do both. But as is often the case, uh, just because you can do two things doesn't mean you do them both well. Um, and so most hospitals use one or the other, HD or CVVH. So this is the sort of a schematic representation that, that I stole uh, from some renal fellow somewhere. Um, the important thing about this is that you can see that the RF stands for replacement fluid in here. Uh, effluent is your, your surrogate urine output. It's hard to call it urine output, but you can think of it as that. So when you go to, the, to talk to the nurse about this C, CRRT, hey, my patient's on CRRT, and you want to know what their fluid losses are, you need to ask about the ultrafiltrate. So when you walk up and you're trying to clear someone's volume, you need to ask what the UF rate is. And all you're really asking for is how much fluid is coming out of the patient. The thing that's challenging in CVVH is you're putting fluid into the blood, right? and then you're taking ultrafiltrate off. If the volume of replacement fluid going in equals the volume of ultrafiltrate coming out, there's no net change in the patient's volume status, right? That's the advantage to us in the ICU because we can clear someone's solute without having to induce large volume shifts. I think most of us, uh, certainly those who've been here for a few years, have had the experience of someone going for their intermittent hemodialysis, coming back up to the floor, getting wildly hypotensive and tachycardic, <laughs> probably falling, uh, and the nurse is calling you saying so-and-so fell after their dialysis today. That patient is like almost nine times out of 10 orthostatically hypotensive because the volume shift from intermittent hemodialysis is huge. The flow rates are enormous and the volumes of dialysate fluid and ultrafiltrate that are pulled off are large. Um, CVVH is sort of the opposite of that in terms of its severity, or it's as close as we can get. Uh, CVVHD is in its truest form, there is no replacement fluid. So what you take off of the patient is the dialysate volume and the effluent volume. So what the patient gives you and your dialysate volume. There is no replacement fluid. So again, you can have large volume shifts uh, with CVVHD, which is why it more commonly is used in the MICU uh, in patients who need clearance of their potassium or their uh, BUN or whatever. And then CVVHDF carries the theoretical benefit of all of those things. But again, it's a little bit more complicated. The prob One of the problems with CVVH is if you're flowing replacement fluid in to achieve a dose for your CRRT, but you're not able to pull ultrafiltrate, you're basically giving the patient large volumes of fluid. Does that make sense? So it can be counterproductive if you're not paying attention. You guys have questions about this, these terrible little diagrams? Conveniently, the machines? No, no questions from you. No, go ahead. Adult ECMO, so 600 mils per minute is uh, dialysis, adult dialysis flow rates, and we're talking liters per minute in the, in the ECMO flow rates. The difference is the ECMO obviously isn't, like it's not pulling volume off. So your blood flow rate, your a typical blood flow rate for uh, intermittent hemodialysis will be around 600 milliliters an hour with replacement fluid flowing sort of close to that same volume, uh, sometimes even higher depending on what the goals are they want to achieve. Um, and then flow rates for ECMO are, are much, much higher. 
Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, conveniently, the ECMO circuits all have, they'll have ports that you can just tap into and you can hook your, your CRT right up to it. Um, the nitty gritty, it gets complicated on which side you pull from, do you pull from the drainage, do you pull from the return, that sort of stuff. And there, there's reasons you would do, want to do one or the other. Um, and they vary a little bit from patient to patient. But yeah, that's, that's a good point. So it's not an issue of how much flow you're pulling out of the patient necessarily. It's that does the flow you're pulling out match the flow you're returning? And in hemodialysis, that, that's not the case. The amount you pull out is not the amount you give back. So there's a net negative change in the volume, the circulating volume within that patient when you're on hemodialysis. Whether that is a large volume over a relatively short period of time. So if you're pulling two liters over six, over, you know, six hours or four hours, or you're pulling four liters even over a, you know, three to four hours on hem intermittent hemodialysis versus you're pulling two hours, two liters over 24 hours or four days or two days or 30 days or whatever you're doing on CRRT, that time is stretched. And so that's the, that's the biggest difference uh, between CVVHD and intermittent hemodialysis. Um, so CVV, I sort of alluded to the fact that CVVH and CVVHD are sort of the two primary modes that we use. Uh, the important thing to remember, CVVH, most common in the STICU or TICU, you can run it even uh, to achieve filtration without diuresis. CVVHD is, if it's truly pure HD, not HDF, right? Uh, you can't run it even, so you can't, you can't actually do that. You're always gonna have a net negative balance. Um, that's much more common in the MICU. It's far faster at reversing hyperkalemia, dialyzable toxins, but um, it's not as fast as intermittent hemodialysis. Again, that goes to Dr. Trepe's point of the fluid flow rates. The flow rates determine your dose, okay? So the higher your replacement fluid flow, higher your dialysate flow rates, they, those things define your ultrafiltrate rate, and the ultrafiltrate rate is the dose in milliliters per kilogram per hour. So, uh, cool story, right? Does it help? So biochemically, absolutely it helps. There's, there's no question that it helps biochemically. You can, you can fix someone's uh, hyperkalemia. You can fix someone's uremia. You can dialyze off uh, phenobarbital and methanol or other uh, dialyzable toxins. Um, but there's no CRRT versus no CRRT study, right? That would be a not terribly ethical thing to do to someone, right? We're gonna take all patients with a potassium of eight and we're gonna fix some and we're not gonna fix the others and we're gonna see who does better. You can see why that study doesn't get done. So that leaves us with a problem where the defined benefit of CRRT is not 100% evident because you can't, you can't say with 100% confidence necessarily that everyone with CRRT with a K of eight can't be fixed with a whole bunch of shifting in time, right? Um, similarly, CRRT versus intermittent hemodialysis studies are not really done in, in our surgical population. Um, and they're troubled by selection bias anyway. So we already know that intermittent hemodialysis causes large volume shifts. That's a risky thing to do in critical care patients. So for the most part, nobody really does that. There have been a couple of studies that have tried to look at it through retrospective data, and even one study looking at some prospectively collected data in a medical ICU population that suggested there wasn't any benefit. However, when you look at the baseline characteristics of this, and I'm not going to belabor you putting all these, these papers up because this isn't something that is like heavily tested in anything that you guys do. Um, but if you look at the baseline characteristics, intermittent hemodialysis for CRT, those uh, patients who received intermittent hemodialysis were far, far healthier. Uh, and that's not surprising because they could actually tolerate intermittent hemodialysis. Research in CRT is super heterogeneous, uh, hetero, heterogeneous, excuse me, um, because there's different modes of CRT, right? And as you might imagine, there's institutional preferences. So if you do, CRT in the burn center, 
it's the burn critical care doctors who are writing and prescribing that CRRT. If you do uh, intermittent hemod if you do uh, CRRT at the VA, it's always nephrology mm -hmm. who's writing for it. Nephrology writes for CVVHDF. We write for CVVH. You know, surgical critical care providers usually use CVVH. It's a little simpler. Um, so because there's all these different ways of doing it, there's not like one good study that says this mode is better than that mode or yes, CRRT is, is the super great thing. Mortality is high in patients who are treated with CRRT and uh, are in the ICU. I said before, like 70% in the COVID population, there are studies that show up to 84% mortality among patients who with high stage acute kidney injury, so stage three. Um, who go on to CRRT. And there's morbidity that's associated with the CRRT initiation placement, you know, line placement, access. So people have focused on timing. Like, when should we start CRRT? Like, we know it makes potassium better. We know it makes BUN better. We know we can control the fluid volume. So when should we do it? Should we do it early? Should we do it late? Should we do, you know, when should we do it? These studies have all been done since, the, since 2016. CRRT has been around for a lot longer than that. It started in like the 1970s with some nephrologist who accidentally put a drainage cannula in an artery instead of in a vein. And then he hooked it up to the circuit and was like, oh, wow, shit, that works. Um, so that's how CRRT sort of started is that positive pressure instead of pulling from the venous side, a positive pressure uh, system. So what people have really focused on is, should we start it early? Should we start it late? Unfortunately, there's not really a super good consensus. And so a lot like neurosurgeons saying that decompressive hemicraniectomy doesn't show any benefit uh, if you do it you know, within the first hour or you do it 12 hours later, that lets them stay in bed for a while. Nephrology feels the same way about CRRT. So CRRT, uh, there is no clear benefit to really early initiation of CRRT versus late initiation of CRRT. This is shown in the Akaki Ideal ICU, start AKI and Akaki 2 trials. Akaki 2 just came out uh, in 2021. Notice I didn't mention Elaine. So the Elaine trial is the one that's probably, I think, most relevant to our population. This is surgical critical, these are surgical critical care patients largely in France. It was a randomized controlled trial at a single center. They had 200 and something, 231 patients there. And they used a relatively, uh, they used Cadigo stage two acute kidney injury or a relatively more mild acute kidney injury for initiation. So if you were diagnosed with this uh, Cadigo stage two acute kidney injury and enrolled in this trial, you were randomized to an arm with initiation of CRRT within eight hours of that diagnosis versus initiation uh, within 12 hours or no initiation. Uh, there was a statistically significant difference in mortality in this population. So those who were started earlier had a better outcome. Uh, so 33% mortality or 39% mortality versus 54% mortality. They had a shorter uh, kidney replacement duration and a shorter hospital stay in those patients who were initiated early. And there was no difference in their complications. So people criticize this study in a couple of ways. One, small study, single center, well, relatively small studies, um, single center. They also criticize it by saying it's mostly surgical patients. Well, I actually see that as an advantage, not as a criticism, because I mostly take care of surgical patients. Um, the other way that people criticize this study is that there uh, was a fair portion, I'm not remembering the number exactly, of patients who, got, who never had initiation of CRRT. So if they never had initiation, can you really say, oh yeah, no, it was the delay, uh, you know, that, that delay, initiation was what caused the mortality. Maybe there was some reason that they didn't get put on. You know, maybe uh, they didn't have an intensivist who could put in a trialysis catheter or something like that. And that's why they didn't get initiated and they really should have been initiated earlier. So if someone never got initiated, they were concerned about that as, as a bias, potential bias in the trial. So Akaki uh, in the ideal ICU and START AKI all looked at initiation and they all had varied definitions of what early was. So you can see early within six hours, within 12 hours, and then the delayed criteria for initiation. So this is where I think it gets interesting. So 
you can have a stage two or a stage three acute kidney injury and not have a life-threatening complication, right? So you can have your urine output tapers off. So you can even become aneuric. You become aneuric for a few hours, um, and your, but your potassium remains normal, your BUN remains normal, et cetera. These trials would have put those patients on CRRT right up front, right? Or randomize them in these trials. So Akaki, Ideal ICU, and START all looked at, if, if you wait until they develop a life-threatening complication, so uh, uh, symptomatic uremia, hyperkalemia, et cetera, what were the outcomes? And they found no real difference. The most recent trial, the Akaki 2 said, well, let's see if we can stretch this out. So the early criteria was 12 hours, and the late criteria was a BUN greater than 50 or any life-threatening complication of uh, AKI. So this study was tr really trying to define, can we, uh, can we wait longer? I don't actually really understand why they were asking that question, to be honest, because the complication, the differences in complications between early initiation and late initiation were largely similar. You can see that, you know, their catheter related bloodstream infections were slightly higher in the Akaki group hyperkalemia occurred more in the late initiation group, but the complications of access, even though they exist, are relatively negligible in the, you know, in totality. Uh, the bottom line is Akaki concluded that there was no difference, right? So the p-value you see there is 0 0.07 with a delta in mortality of 44 to 55%. I would argue that that is a statistically insignificant result that is clinically significant. So a 10% difference in mortality uh, can be significant. I think this study suggests, and I can't say this with confidence because again, it's not statistically significant, that if you believe someone is going to need CRRT, that, it, that waiting until they develop a life-threatening complication may carry additional risk. That's sort of the important thing to remember. So, I wouldn't, I think it basically means that we're smart enough to recognize someone who is getting sicker and is likely to need CRRT, at least in the adult population. I see traffic back there. I don't do kids. Um, so that more or less covers everything we're gonna talk about for CRRT. Does anybody have any quick questions about CRRT? Okay, so Mars. So conveniently, oh shit, here we go. Conveniently, we'll be able to get through a bunch of this really fast and talk about Mars. Um, so disclosures, nothing. Uh, we'll skip that. So liver failure. Uh, liver failure is very poorly defined. It's, it's really poorly defined. Uh, a lot of studies will look at impairment, uh, INR greater than 1.5, they'll look at hepatic encephalopathy, in order to use hepatic encephalopathy to define it, it has to be less than 26 weeks from the insult that caused the liver injury. Uh, they can't have a history of uh, cirrhosis or chronic liver disease, including alcohol use or abuse rather. Um, it may or may not be accompanied by severe jaundice. Uh, and then it's substratified into three different categories, hyperacute, acute, and subacute. These dates, these times, these are the kind of things that show up on like app sites and you know, boards and stuff like that. Uh, in the United States, acute liver failure is predominantly caused by toxic ingestion, either intentional uh, uninten or unintentional. There's cryptogenic, which is the unknown category, and then the hepatitis, the hepatitis viruses, so hepatitis A, B, E, uh, and then other. And the other is the group um, that we see in the trial population, so like acute injury, et cetera. Acute liver failure in the U.S. acetaminophen is the most common cause. Um, yeah, that's the cytochrome P450 uh, thing that is why NAPQI is formed, et cetera. Um, acute liver failure carries a high mortality. So acute liver failure in sepsis, mortality is over half of the patients in COVID, greater than 40% in severe liver injuries. So these are patients with a transaminitis, not even acute liver failure, 
the data for the acute liver failure stuff isn't quite out yet, but you can easily imagine it's going to be a lot worse than 40%. Uh, hypoperfusion, in-hospital mortality for shock liver varies widely, and that's largely because the studies that have looked at this are, are pretty small, they're institutional, uh, but it ranges somewhere between 14 and 76. I would say that uh, it's probably closer to 50% mortality, at least in my experience, looking at acute liver injury and hypoperfusion. Uh, and then post-hepatectomy liver failure carries a, a mortality rate of 30 to 50% uh, in all comers who have undergone like elective hepatectomy and then developed liver failure afterwards. Uh, we're not really going to go through all of this. Uh, the only thing we're going to really cover is that um, medical therapy is sort of focused on a couple different things, treating the encephalopathy, preventing bleeding, uh, in uh, N-acetylcysteine or mucomist. Uh, has been shown to improve transplant-free survival in non-acetaminophen-induced acute liver failure. This is relatively uh, controversial. There are some studies that suggest that that, uh, there are a few people who are arguing that that is not the case, but the current literature suggests that there is some benefit to the use of mucomist in non-acetaminophen-associated liver failure. The thought is that this has to do with the NAPQI, that cytochrome P450, uh, offloading that allows it to metabolize other agents, either endogenous or exogenous agents that may be contributing to a toxic hepatopathy that, that we're not fully understanding. Um, and renal replacement therapy, if it's needed. Uh, liver failure often begets renal failure or the other way around. Uh, and then orthotopic liver transplantation is the most effective means. <clears throat> so extracorporeal liver support technologies are really two categories. So there's ECAD, the extracorporeal albumin dialysis, and then there's bioartificial liver support, and that's the bioreactors. The two predominant devices are the molecular absorbent recirculating system, MARS. That's what we're largely going to talk about today. Uh, and these all function based on dialysis. So you'll see some diagrams that are similar to um, what we already had talked about. And then the bioartificial liver support, they use... Uh, uh, either porcine or human hepatocytes in a bioreactor and flow blood through those. As you can imagine, the FDA is, um, well, we'll just say they are not um, particularly keen on rushing these technologies through. They use uh, biologic tissues. Um, the hepatocyst device uses porcine hepatocytes. ELAD uses human-derived uh, liver cells. So the ELAD, you can see this right here. I can't seem to find the cursor. Anyway, see the dude, the pumping system, ultrafiltrate generator. So that system right there is your dialysis. And then this system in the dotted line is your liver assist in this case. So the, the theoretical advantages to using a bioartificial liver support technology is that it can uh, also do hepatic synthetic function and not just hepatic clearance processes. That's really the big, big advantage. Their cost complexity, the risk of zoonosis, the risk of immunologic issues, et cetera, that means that these are all still in phase two or three clinical trials. Nobody's using these in a you know, sort of real way right now. Extracorporeal albumin dialysis, there's three different varieties, um, molecular absorbent recirculating system, and then Prometheus, and then SPAD. Uh, SPAD is single pass albumin dialysis. SPAD is the one that's most similar to CRRT. It's, they have a proprietary little circuit filter you put on there. And instead of using dialysate, you use 5% human albumin. And so you flow a countercurrent of 5% human albumin across, <coughs> across the filter. And you use a large high flux filter. So large pore high flux filter allows a bunch of stuff to cross. You can just think about it that way, right? It allows a bunch of stuff to come across that wouldn't normally come across a dialysis filter. It's trapped in the albumin. The albumin acts as a sink to protein-bound toxins, which is largely what the liver is doing when it comes to toxin removal. Uh, Prometheus and uh, the Mars system both use adsorption circuits, like we talked about before, so charcoal-laden adsorption circuits, as well as a dialysis system. And whether they're in series or in parallel is really the difference between those two technologies. The theoretical advantage to Mars is, bottom line, it's the most studied. It has, does both conventional and albumin dialysis. It's frequently used in Asia and in Europe. 
So in Asia, I'm sure Dr. Vreeland would say that in Asia, they do a lot of liver surgery um, for various different reasons. Uh, and they use Mars not infrequently um, in that setting. <clears throat> they also have a lot of liver failure. I don't know if you've ever been to a Korean bar. Um, anyway, it's, it's well earned. Um, Prometheus has some of the same advantages. It uses a fractionated serum. So the difference between, uh, the big difference between Prometheus and Mars is that uh, Mars uses the ultrafiltrate. The Prometheus actually has a filter that allows the human serum to cross the filter. And so it's the human serum that's running through the dialysate circuit, not an ultrafiltrate. So they say that that's better. Nobody really knows right now. And then SPAD, the real advantage is it's the simplest system. Um, you can use a regular CRT machine and plug your own circuit into it and then just hang a couple thousand dollars worth of uh, albumin and call it a day. <clears throat> so Mars itself, it's a form of extracorporeal albumin dialysis. <clears throat> what you see here is the, so their system is a little different in that this first filter is the filter uh, that allows the uh, protein bound toxins, et cetera, to cross. It crosses this albumin circuit. So this is all albumin flowing in this yellow part in the middle. That albumin flows out and it goes across this dial, this filter. This is a CRRP filter. Don't look the fancy name. This is a regular old CRRP filter. And so they do a hemodialysis across this filter and you get your ultra filtrate, just like you would any other dialysis circuit. The difference is that this isn't dialyzing off of the blood, it's dialyzing off of an albumin circuit. Within that albumin circuit, there's two absorb absorption filters. One, uh, one of those absor absorption filters, excuse me, is to pick up the protein bound toxins and the other is to pick up uh, <clears throat> Uh, the smaller, uh, the smaller toxins. So, access is the same. It's just CRT access. The dialysis circuit um, removes the water soluble toxins. So that's just dialysis. The albumin circuit is different, and that it uses these two filters. So the ion exchange resin and the activated charcoal. So an ion exchange resin will remove bilirubin and other polar molecules. This is similar to what they use in. Uh, uh, some of the plasma exchange filters, they'll use an ion exchange as well. And then the activated charcoal filter, you can just think about this as like pouring activated charcoal down someone's throat, except instead you're running uh, albumin through it. The main indications for Mars therapy, acute liver failure, acute decompensation of chronic liver disease, uh, complicated renal failure, or excuse me, uh, hepatic encephalopathy, liver failure complicated by hepatic encephalopathy, complicated by renal dysfunction. They even some people use it for intractable pruritus and cholestasis, which is a little surprising to me, but uh, it works. Um, and then acute intoxication, and then after a liver failure. So for, for surgeons, after liver failure, I think is an important, uh, an important indication. So does Mars work? Again, like regular analysis, biochemically, yes, it does. If it didn't work biochemically, no one would have put millions of dollars into developing the technology. Um, but yeah, it works. Uh, so it will lower your bilirubin, it will lower the concentration of bile acids, uh, and this is compared to hemodia filtration. So it's not really fair to say Mars to nothing, right? You have to compare it to something. And in this case, thankfully, Mars is still relatively experimental. So there actually is some data saying Mars versus something that's not Mars. Um, but does Mar Mars work clinically? And this is where I think it's sort of interesting. So this is, there's some mixed data. So uh, shock trauma, they looked at 27 patients retrospectively who they put on Mars. They evaluated before and after Mars. They treated with eight hours of Mars, 16 hours of CRT uh, only. And they did three Mars treatments unless the patient went on to orthotopic liver transplantation and then they stopped. Their definitions, uh, their indications were severe liver trauma and failure, uh, definitive treatment or bridge to transplant. So when you look at their groups, um, where it's red on the left is before Mars, 
And then where it's green on the right is you would think of that as an advantageous change, right? So M anemia went down, INR went down, encephalopathy remained essentially the same uh, in the urine output. Um, the urine output, more of those patients progressed to renal failure actually. So patients put on, um, did stop having um, autogenous urine output. A lot of people would uh, argue that the encephalopathy is not surprising because these are trauma patients. And so a, a lot number of these patients actually had concomitant head injuries as well. Um, but it does improve the INR and it does improve aminemia in this population. When they looked at their overall survival um, of those patients, again, 27 patients, not a big study. Uh, what they found was that survival after Mars, if you stratify it by liver injury, was pretty similar, but survival without Mars uh, was not great. Uh, and if you had Mars and you didn't get a bridge to transplant, it wasn't great. So the bottom line here is it works to get you to transplant, but you still need transplant in this pop in these populations. So in this, this is surgical critical care in, uh, in trauma. <clears throat> uh, Mars in uh, Helsinki, so 113 patients compared with historic controls, probably a, a more sick uh, a more sick control group here showed the following here. So uh, very sick group, but there was a delta in patients who had an unknown uh, cause of their liver injury. In patients who had uh, liver failure due to uh, toxic ingestion, Mars is actually very effective. And so the suspicion is that these unknown patients who did better were patients who probably had a toxic ingestion and they just didn't know what the toxic, toxic agent was. Um, in France, they looked at 102 acute liver failure patients. They found no statistically significant survival rate. Uh, this study was primarily criticized by a very high transplantation rate, 60%, in that uh, patients, whether or not they were in the Mars arm or in the no Mars arm, were both considered as candidates for uh, orthotopic liver transplant. And in this large transplant hospital, not surprisingly, many of them went on to transplant. So this might not be uh, generalizable to institutions that don't have large transplant centers available. Uh, and so the delta may be different. So the probability re to receive orthotopic liver transplantation was increased in the uh, MARS group. And some people suggest that in this study, one of the things they were saying is maybe one of the best things about MARS is you can correct someone's encephalopathy and you can determine whether they're a candidate for tra uh, liver transplant. So there were patients who go on to Mars and they don't correct their encephalopathy. If they don't correct their encephalopathy, they're probably not gonna be a candidate for liver transplant because liver transplant won't improve those outcomes anyway. Um, so some people are suggesting using it in that setting. Uh, the relief trial looked at the use of uh, Mars in acute on chronic liver failure. And they found essentially no difference whether they analyzed by intention to treat or per protocol analysis. So their argument was there's no survival benefit. However, um, in follow on studies, they looked at acute on chronic liver failure grade wise. They re stratified those patients. They identified the patients who had grade one liver failure or not very bad liver failure. Standard medical therapy and MARS were essentially similar. There wasn't a significant difference in their overall mortality. But in the more severe, liver failure patients, grade two, acute and chronic liver failure, there was a statistically significant uh, improvement in mortality um, in patients who were placed on Mars. Again, largely because it bridged those patients to transplant. Uh, looking at systematic reviews, there's five studies, 34 patients focused on Mars and post-hepatectomy liver failure. This is an area that I think is, is of interest. Um, although no conclusion can be drawn uh, regarding the efficacy of Mars and post-hepatectomy liver failure, Mars is feasible, uh, and they think that additional study is, is, uh, is needed. So I think there's a suggestion, and this is one of the areas that people are most interested in because the mortality rate is so high in post-hepatectomy liver failure that if you can bridge someone through the toxic insult that they've had, so 
a common pathway for post-epitectomy liver failure is beautiful surgery done by great surgical oncologist, followed by either post-operative complication or infectious complication, followed by sepsis, followed by death. So if you can bridge that person's liver function through correction of their sepsis or whatever the other insult is, that they may be able to have uh, liver recovery. And that's been demonstrated at least in onesies and twosies. Nobody knows if this works writ large because the population is so small. So it's very, very hard to enroll a study large enough to get useful data out of. Uh, in the ECMO population, so this can also be hooked up to an ECMO circuit. So at Thomas Edison uh, University, they were looking at overall um, outcomes in ECMO patients. These are uh, patients who started out uh, on ECMO and then developed acute liver failure, and it was left to the surgeon's discretion about whether or not to initiate MARS. They found that in the patients who uh, were initiated on MARS, bilirubin dropped, the ALT dropped, and the INR dropped. These seem like they're not all that significant, but in a population who's at enormous risk for bleeding complications, being able to correct someone's uh, INR back to close to normal um, is, is significant. They also found that there was um, a difference in mortality uh, in 30 day survival, or excuse me, in non statistically significant difference in mortality or survival. And then they found a statistically significant difference in survival to wean. So a successful wean from uh, ECMO. So would I use MARS? Yeah, but only in select patients. Um, MARS is a rescue therapy. It's most effective as a bridge to transplant. Uh, the population that should be used in is a hyperacute and acute liver failure. I think due to trauma, those patients may benefit from uh, MARS because they may become improved candidates for orthotopic liver transplant. They can perioperatively uh, optimize patients who have uh, underlying liver disease. It can improve uh, coagulopathy and reduce the severity of encephalopathy in these patients. Um, and it may provide them the capacity for medical decision-making. So if you have a patient who's obtunded from liver failure and you put them on Mars, you may be able to get them to a point where you can actually have a discussion with the patient rather than the family about, uh, about their medical wishes. Um, it does appear to reduce overall healthcare interventions. If you can improve someone's encephalopathy, they probably don't need a bolt. Um, that's a good example. And then it may be the last best hope for patients with post hepatectomy liver failure, high mortality population. And then it's pretty clear that it has a role in ECMO, or it's starting to become clear there's a role in ECMO. All right. And I probably went over time.